And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the second day of the Kiletsky Conference, co-hosted by the Review of Political Economy, the Association of Social Economics, as well as the Lipinski Foundation. Today we have four papers for presentations by Robert Blecker, Malcolm Sawyer, Eckert Hein, and Jan Toporowski. The first paper by Robert Blecker on the basic Kilekian model. To introduce our guest speaker, uh, one of the co-organizers of the conference, Marcin Kehor. Okay, so uh, Lydia Brochier is an assistant professor of the Institute of Economics and the graduate program in economics of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Her current research focus on demand-led growth and the dynamics of autonomous expenditures using stock flow consistent models. Her work has been published by international peer review journals, such as the Cambridge Journal, journal of Economics and the Metro Economica, International Review of Economics. She is also currently one of the coordinators of the research seminars of the graduate program in economics at the Institute of Economics in, uh, at the University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Lydia, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Marcin, uh, and thank you, Louis Philippe. I'm very glad to take part in this conference honoring Kaletsky uh, and his contributions. Um, before we start the session, I would like to remind the audience uh, to keep the microphones muted. Uh, I also kindly ask you to wait until the end of our guest's presentation to ask your questions. Uh, those interested in asking questions can either leave the questions in the chat box and then I can read a question to our guests if you want, or you can raise your virtual hands uh, in the participants window. In the bottom left of this window, there is a hand icon. Just click on it if you have a question. Uh, I will call those interested, uh, those of you interested in asking questions at the appropriate time, so uh, you can ask the questions yourselves. Uh, this session will be 90 minutes long. Uh, so uh, we can move now to introducing our, our guest of this session. Uh, Robert Blacker is Professor of Economics at the American University, Washington, D.C., and a Fellow of the Forum for Macroeconomics uh, and Macroeconomic Policy, uh, FMM. Uh, he received his B.A. in Economics from Yale University, uh, his M.A. and Ph.D. from Stanford University, his most recent book is Heterodox Macroeconomics, Models of Demand, Distribution and Growth, co-authored with Ma Mark Satterfield. Yeah, that is the book. Uh, Edward Elgar published in 2019. Uh, he has published widely in leading economics journals, including the Cambridge Journal of Economics, Economica, International Review of Applied Economics, Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics, Metro Economica, Review of Keynesian Economics, uh, Structural Change in Economic Dynamics, and World Development. Uh, his research includes work on Nikolaitskian macro theory, post Keynesian models of open economies, uh, international trade theory and policy, economic integration in North America, glo global imbalances in the US trade deficit, the Mexican economy, North South trade, and ex export led growth. Uh, so the topic of Robert's presentation today will be the basic Kaletskian model. Uh, so Robert, please, you have the virtual floor. Thank you very much, Lydia. This is actually the second time Lydia has introduced me this year because I had the honor to do a webinar at the uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in July, and she was my session chair then, so thank you once again. And I also want to say hello to all my good friends and colleagues out there around the world, and that it's truly an honor and a privilege to have been invited to participate in this gathering in honor of Kaletsky, one of my great intellectual heroes. I have been talking to Louis Philippe about this on email. As I was preparing for this, I reread some of uh, Kaletsky's original work. Well, that's not what I will be discussing, uh, but it just reminded me of him, his incredible brilliance his foresight, if you reread the essay on uh, the, the, what's the political aspects of uh, full employment from 1943, he foresaw so much of the post-war era right up to today. It's amazingly prescient. Um, and also reading 
rereading about his life and learning so much from the talks yesterday, we learn or remind ourselves of his bravery uh, under very adverse circumstances, both politically and personally in many cases. And, and it's a lesson that is very meaningful uh, given the political circumstances in many parts of the world today. So with that, I will um, turn to my presentation uh, and share my screen. Hopefully the screen sharing is working. Yes. Good. Yes. This is just yes. like teaching now. This is how we teach classes. Okay, so I have made one little amendment to the title from what I was assigned by Louis Philippe and the organizers. I will be discussing the basic neo galetskian macro model. Um, I'll explain what I mean uh, in a moment. I, uh, they didn't define the basic Galetskian model, so I uh, essentially decided uh, what I would cover. Um, so what I will not do this morning or evening, whatever time it may be where you are, I will not be providing an exegesis of Galetsky's own macro models. That would be a really interesting and important exercise, but that is not what I will do today. What I will do instead is to focus on the neo Galetskian models that were developed in the decades following his death, that is between the 1970s and the 1990s. Uh, they will be all simplified versions for presentational purposes, leaving out you know, many of the different cases and uh, situations that, that were covered by the different authors. And something that would, I don't put it in the presentation, but that would be interesting to discuss uh, after I finish uh, would be to what extent these models reflect Koletsky's ideas or brought new ideas uh, to bear. At the end of the presentation, I will very briefly summarize a few other things. First, the huge literatures uh, that have uh, grown up extending, applying, or critiquing uh, the Koletskian approach. Um, and what I call mainstream echoes, the fact that uh, Koletsky's work foreshadowed a lot of things that are now in mainstream macro or mainstream economics, usually without recognizing Koletsky's priority in those areas. And then I will conclude with a few hopefully provocative suggestions, although with such an august audience, I'm sure there is no need to be provocative to uh, spark a conversation. So I want to begin by saying what I think is really unique in the Koletskian approach to macro modeling. This isn't just Neo, this is the original and, the, and the, the later works. And I start by reminding you what I just said. There are other theories, including today many mainstream theories, that accept some of the pieces of what uh, Koletsky did. For example, there are macro models with oligopolistic firms and markup pricing. Uh, it is common, at least in policy discussions, to acknowledge that the richer people in the population have a lower marginal propensity to consume or a higher propensity to save. And there's a great deal of interest today in understanding uh, increased inequality and the falling labor share in relation to macroeconomics. So there are actually a lot of Koletskian ideas uh, in the air and that have entered into other traditions. But I think the Koletskian tradition is still unique in the way it puts all of this together, the following chain of causality. Uh, it starts with a micro foundation, which is a theory of oligopolistic markup pricing. That in turn determines the distribution of income, uh, the functional distribution between wages and profits. That in turn affects uh, the elements of aggregate demand, consumption, investment, and net exports in open economy models, which in turn affects macroeconomic outcomes, such as util the utilization rate, employment, growth. And then there are feedbacks of all kinds to uh, productivity growth, for example, and back to the ability of firms to set markups into income distribution. Uh, so it's not really a one-way chain of causality, but it's a dynamic evolving process. I would, however, admit that the Koletskian framework, at least as I will present it, is not by itself a complete macro framework. Uh, it needs to be augmented with analyses of things such as money, 
finance, uh, inflation, technology, the labor bargaining process, the role of public sector, and other forms of inequality or income distribution aside from the functional uh, division between wages and profits. And I will come back to some of the efforts to integrate these things toward the end. So what I'm going to do is cover three generations of models in some depth. Uh, and the first generation starts with my mentor and professor, Don Harris, in a 1974 paper, and a Canadian, uh, I think he was Tony Asima Copulist, do I have that right? Canadian friends, um, in a 1975 paper. And I think they independently invented very similar uh, formalizations of Kolesky's ideas. So uh, what I do here is to present a simplified version of the common elements in both of them, leaving out some additional complications that each one introduced. Um, so you start with the markup pricing equation. I think the notation should be pretty obvious to everybody. P is the price level, tau is the markup rate, W is the nominal wage, A0 is the labor coefficient. You have the national income identity that wages plus profits must add up to the value of national income. And importantly, in this early model, and it was a key feature of Kolesky's original work, there are two kinds of labor, production workers uh, whose hours are proportional to output, I call them L0, and overhead labor, professional and managerial workers, supervisors, who for simplicity are taken as being exogenously fixed, at least in the short run. Uh, and for simplicity, the two kinds of labor have the same wage rate, although an obvious extension, which has been done in later literature, is to distinguish their, their wages. By the way, if you know the original papers, I have reversed the numbers zero and one. Uh, I did this for consistency with the notation in my book with Mark. Uh, so without going into any math, uh, we can solve this easily for the profit share pi and the labor productivity Q. And we come to two important conclusions. First, uh, the profit share is positively, positively related to the markup rate tau, and that's extremely important. This is this core idea of Kolesky's that the functional distribution of income was determined by markups. Uh, here I have, we have simplified by aggregating into a sort of representative firm. But of course, for Kolesky, it was the outcome of a lot of different oligopolistic firms uh, competing in the economy. The second important conclusion, and one that is very relevant to recent empirical studies, but often forgotten, is that both of these variables are positively related to output. That is, they are pro-cyclical as long as there is some overhead labor. That is, if L1 is greater than zero, both the profit share and labor productivity are necessarily pro-cyclical. The uh, authors of this generation, Harris and Asimikopoulos, uh, assumed that investment is exogenous. They had different savings functions. Here I'm using the simpler one from Asimikopoulos. Harris also had saving out of wages. But here I, we assume, more like Joan Robinson, that all savings come out of profits. Uh, and then from the saving equal investment equilibrium condition, we get reduced form solutions for equilibrium profits, a profit share and output. Um, the profit share, of course, is again positively related to the markup tau, but output is inversely related to the markup. And that tells us this key implication that when there's greater monopoly power in the economy and average markups rise and the profit share rises, we get a depression of output. That is an effect has become known as a, a stagnationist outcome or is the, the, the uh, Kolesskyan explanation for, for economic stagnation fundamentally. And we also see once again, uh, an important element of cyclicality. A cyclical rise in investment, which remember is just exogenous in these models, will increase both output, but also the profit share. And this can create the false impression that demand is profit-led, when in fact the cause of rising output is not the profits, 
uh, but rather an investment boom, an autonomous investment boom. And I think this may have influenced some of the empirical literature, but I'm not going to talk about that now. Moving along, what I defined as the second generation models were models that then endogenized investment uh, and also focused more on the capacity utilization rate uh, rather than just output. Uh, really the first article of this type that I'm aware of, and I was told about this by, by Mark Lavoie, is the article by Del Monte in 1976, so just a year after Asimokopoulos, it was written in Italian and therefore unfortunately did not get the attention uh, in most of the rest of the world. I actually got a copy and read it. Uh, I could at least follow the math and my Spanish helped me to understand the Italian uh, passably. Uh, but the, and it's a brilliant model. Uh, but later Bob Rothorn, Amitava Dutt, who I think is here with us today, Lance Taylor and various others uh, developed this sort of model in the uh, early 1980s. And as I understand it from talking to Amitava, he and Bob Rothorn independently invented these key ideas, and neither one of them was aware of Del Monte's work at the time. Amitava can comment on that later if he wishes. Uh, so uh, the way, now these models, of course, are quite diverse. And so once again, I will present a simplified version of the common elements and there is some influence of uh, Koletsky's colleague, Joseph Steindl, uh, in this formalization. In fact, Amitava once called it the Koletsky Steindl closure uh, of a heterodox macro model. I will also simplify here by assuming that there's no overhead labor. Uh, one could keep overhead labor in this. Uh, Rothorn did, and Mark Lovat uh, usually does, but I will make that simplification here. In that case, the profit share is not cyclical. It depends only on the markup in a very stark fashion. Um, and the real wage is what you see here. It depends uh, inversely on the markup uh, or one minus pi, which is the wage share. And it is related to labor productivity. One over the labor coefficient A0 is labor productivity. And that's very important because in the basic formulation, the real wage actually is independent of the nominal wage, unless raising the nominal wage can affect uh, the markup and therefore uh, the profit or wage shares, or unless it can have some influence on productivity, but there's no direct effect of the money wage on the real wage. Uh, I will introduce such a, an effect in the open economy version of the model when I get to the third generation. The profit rate here, this is a well-known uh, formulation, is then equal to the profit share pi times the utilization rate u divided by the uh, uh, capital coefficient. A little a1 is the ratio of capital to potential output k over yp, and u is the ratio of actual output to potential output. And under normal conditions, as Koletskins, we would assume that output is less than or equal to potential and utilization is less than or equal to one, and normally uh, the less than signs would apply. Uh, we will keep the same saving function for now, and it was used in most of those uh, this generation of literature, except that now we can substitute for the profit rate as pi u over a1. And what's important here is that both of these rates the profit rate and the saving rate depend on capacity utilization, and that has very important implications. And of course, uh, the assumption that there was excess capacity and utilization is normally less than one uh, was the key element of, of all of, of Koletsky's macro thinking. I maybe forgot to say that, but it should be emphasized. Now, the other distinguishing feature of this second generation is an investment function like this one. Amitava called it the Koletsky Steindl investment function in his 1987 response to Marglin. And uh, so, investment here, I write it in a linear form, is a function of the profit rate and the utilization rate. 
all parameters are positive in the simple version. Uh, this includes realized profits are, because of Nikletsky and Dew, profits provide the internal finance for investment to relax financial constraints and address the increasing risk of greater investment spending. And there's also a separate accelerator effect of capacity utilization, which was an element emphasized by Steindl. Um, given the equilibrium condition that savings equals investment, we get solutions like this. And I don't want to emphasize the math too much in this brief presentation, but you see very obviously why I had to assume that G0 is uh, positive here and uh, to get a positive solution. Uh, however, in more complex models where there's other terms in the numerators, a G0 could possibly be negative. Uh, can you mute your microphone, please? Thank you. Um, and assuming the, the stability condition holds, the, the denominators are positive. Now, the key implications of this are what Amit Baduri, who may be here today, I'm not sure, and Steve Margaret called cooperative stagnation, or uh, in more recent terminology, uh, I would call it an all wage led demand regime. And that is the strong result that an increase in the profit share caused by a rise in the markup rate reduces the equilibrium rates of capacity utilization, growth in the sense of capital accumulation, and even reduces the realized profit rate. This is, of course, assuming that the stability condition holds and that all those key parameters are positive. Every one of these derivatives, you don't need to worry about the details uh, for now. They are important, but not in this short presentation. But the derivative of the utilization rate with respect to pi, and remember, pi is driven uh, strictly by the, by the markup here. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping of the markup into the profit share in this simple model. That's not true in more complex models. Uh, so there's a negative effect on capacity utilization, a negative effect on the growth rate, and even a negative effect on the realized profit rate. Uh, the first result can be called wage-led demand or stagnationism. This result, I think the best term is wage-led growth. This effect on profits was called by Rothorn the paradox of costs, uh, and it's also an element of what Margulin Baduri described as cooperative stagnationism. So their idea was that this regime, if it exists, would permit a class compromise over distribution and growth. Um, I, I don't know, and I think Amit would have to speak to this if he's here, uh, how much they saw that as politically feasible, but certainly Kolecki in the 1943 essay that I referred to was very skeptical that the capitalists would in fact cooperate that they actually might find their power and their dominance in society to be more important than the realized profit rate, or that they would find other ways to increase their profits, for example, by suppressing labor uh, or offshoring or something else, rather than allowing a, a class compromise that would raise distributive shares. By the way, Kolecki's essay was focused rather on expansionary fiscal policy and why capitalists would object to a fiscal policy that sustained full employment. But I, I, full employment. But, but I think the same arguments would apply to uh, efforts to have a distributional class compromise. Uh, that set of models then led to a response by the late 1980s and into the early 1990s that I call the third generation of neo Kolecki models. Although some people, for example, Eckhard Hein, who perhaps is also here today, uh, have called these the post kolecki models. So you can use whatever term you like. Uh, these models were inspired by some skepticism that the world is as wage-led uh, and as prone to class compromises as it appeared in the second generation models. And so these models identified three result, uh, sorry, three routes, three ways of showing the possibility of profit-led demand, uh, but all in the context of Kolecki's systems in which there is underutilization of capacity and output and growth are demand-led. 
So these are not classical models, although some of them are arguably more of classical inspiration, uh, but they, they do accept the basic Paletzkian premises of variable capacity utilization and excess capacity, and output is demand determined. The first method is, pos is to introduce positive saving out of wages. And it's a little hard to identify who first did this. It was actually in Harris's model and an appendix of Asimokopoulos's model. Taylor did it in some papers. Uh, Tracy Mott and Ed Slattery did it in some papers in the early 90s. And I talked about it a lot much later in a 2002 uh, book chapter. Uh, so it was always in the air. And of course, it was in the original of Kaletsky. But what I think we all didn't realize much was that it can really change the result even without introducing the more famous changes, which are number two and three. Uh, the second approach, and the one that has received by far the most attention in the literature, is the approach of uh, Amit Baduri and Steve Marglin, which was also adopted by Heinz Kurtz, and that is to have a more general, or allegedly more general investment function, which permits a profit-led outcome, even in a closed economy with no saving out of wages. And the third approach is the one that I will uh, humbly say I uh, contributed to, which is the open economy, the Okoletsky model that introduces uh, international competition. So I won't bore you with all the math, but if you have positive saving out of wages, and notice I have to say saving out of wages and not worker savings for the reasons discussed by Passanetti uh, back in, when was it, 1962, I think. Uh, and to make a long story short, we now get a derivative of the equilibrium utilization rate with respect to the profit share or the markup, which is ambiguous in sign. Uh, and the same is true for the derivatives for uh, the profit rate and the growth rate. So now we can have either profit-led or wage-led regimes. And I would also point out, and again, this has received less attention, but I think it's quite important, the nature of the tax regime also matters because the gap between the tax rates out of profit and wage income plays an analogous role to the gap between the saving propensities out of profits and, and wages in determining whether a growth regime is wage-led or, or profit-led. So the tax regime is quite important. Um, the second approach is the baduri marglin investment function, where, for reasons of time, I will have to make this story very short. But essentially, they've made investment a function of the profit share rather than the profit rate and the utilization rate, uh, based on a very uh, thoughtful critique of the other formulation of the investment function. Their argument was that this would avoid double counting of utilization, which is otherwise included in the uh, profit rate, and which, in their view, imposes something they called a strong accelerator effect. The this formulation allows for what they call a strong profitability effect instead. However, it does neglect the Kaletsky Steindl emphasis on realized profits generating internal funds, something that Minsky later modeled as the corporate cash flow. Uh, because this profit share is not affected by utilization, so it does not show the profits actually realized, only the, the fraction of each dollar of profits uh, that goes sorry, of each dollar of income that goes to profits. In any case, the point was clear. The outcome is in this derivative. Now when we take the derivative of utilization with respect to the profit share, we get an ambiguous sign. Unlike, if you go back to the, uh, Kleke, the uh, second generation model, what happens here is that the stability condition forces the numerator to be negative. But in the uh, baduri marglin model, the stability condition, which is the denominator being positive, does not force the numerator to have either sign. So demand can be either wage-led or profit-led. I would point out, however, and this is also, I think, not received sufficient attention. In a closed economy with no government and no saving out of wages, which is what uh, they modeled, in order to get wage-led demand, that is for this a derivative to be positive, you actually require a very strong profitability effect. That is the elasticity of investment with respect to the profit share has to be greater than unity. And you cannot get that, for example, with a linearized 
investment function, only with a nonlinear one. Then came the open economy, or actually more simultaneously came the open economy or international competition uh, version of the Neo-Kolevskian model. And here, uh, inspired by some of Kolevsky's work, but also going beyond it, I came up with the idea of making the markup factor uh, a function of international competition in the form of the real exchange rate. Although I think you could use the relative unit labor costs foreign to home and get a qualitatively similar uh, result. So the idea here is that MU is a parameter I call the target markup factor, which reflects the, the monopoly power of firms or Kolevsky's degree of monopoly. And theta is a, an elasticity determined, uh, representing the, the degree to which a real appreciation of the currency squeezes the markup. And, and the analogy to Kolevsky in his 1971 paper on um, class struggle and the distribution of income is that in that paper, uh, he dealt only with a closed economy. I went back and reread it. I was disappointed to see he never talked about an open economy. But he does talk about how a rise in costs uh, due to labor militancy, in, uh, labor costs in, in one firm or industry or sector can squeeze profit markups and thereby redistribute income to labor. And so that was the idea that I, I tried to model here. This also links that to a literature from the 1980s on partial pass-through of exchange rates, but I don't have time to talk about that. The upshot of all this is that the profit share becomes an endogenous variable determined by two underlying parameters. One is this move representing monopoly power, and the other is Z if you're an American, or Z if you're British, and depending on where you learned your English, it's either Z or Z, and this Z ratio is a, an indicator an indicator of home country competitiveness at unit labor costs relative to foreign prices. The higher is Z, the more competitive is the domestic, uh, the home country. And the result of this model is that uh, not only can demand be either wage led or profit led, but the outcome depends also on the source of a distributional shift. That is, whether mu or pa, uh, sorry, mu or z increases uh, has different results. They both raise the profit share, but they have opposite effects on international competitiveness. That is, on the real exchange rate, and so they have different effects on aggregate demand. Uh, to complete this model, we can add a linearized version of a Baduri margul investment function. But frankly, you could use the Kolevsky Steinle version instead, it would still work. A simplified trade balance function, where uh, the trade balance as a ratio to the capital stock is a function of uh, the real exchange rate and capacity utilization. And uh, here I use the general uh, the saving function, which includes positive saving out of wages, but you could simplify that if you wanted to. And the equilibrium condition, of course, now includes. Uh, the trade balance or current account balance. And I know this looks like an intimidating amount of math, and so you don't need to look at the uh, Greek letters and Roman letters and subscripts if you don't want to, but it's summarized here in these uh, colorful labels. Uh, but notice that we have to take derivatives now with respect to the underlying determinants of the markup, monopoly power mu, or labor cost competitive to Z, and the derivatives are actually different. The domestic parts are similar. If you raise the profit share, share by either of these means, or raise the markup and the profit share by either of these means, you will get a positive effect on investment and a negative effect on consumption. How big those are then depends on the magnitudes of all these parameters. That's true in both cases. But when we get to the impact on net exports, the signs are opposite, negative for monopoly power and positive for labor cost competitiveness. So if you're more competitive, meaning your labor costs are relatively lower, that increases net exports. Whereas if you have more monopoly power resulting in higher markups, assuming, and this is a strong assumption, uh, that the same markups are applied to exports, it would reduce or, or to domestic goods that compete with imports, it would reduce net exports. 
And so because of these different signs, changes in monopoly power are more likely to be wage-led because a negative sign for the whole derivative is, is a wage-led outcome. While changes in labor cost competitiveness are more likely to have profit-led uh, effects. And in a, a, a recent paper, which is the one I presented at the seminar in Rio, some co-authors, Yun Kim and Mike Pavel and I, actually estimated a, lot, a model similar to this and showed the differences between these effects uh, for the US economy. But I won't go into that here. So to summarize uh, the implications of all of these models, uh, particularly the third generation, demand and growth are more likely to be wage-led under all of these conditions here, and then profit-led in the opposite situation. So a large gap between the saving propensities out of profits and wages relative to uh, the uh, profitability effect on investment, whatever that may be in your model, uh, makes the economy more likely to be wage-led and in the opposite case, profit-led. A strong accelerator effect on investment, G2 or HU, uh, tilts in the wage-led direction. If those effects are weak, effects are weak, that tilts in the profit-led direction. Uh, also, this uh, difference in the causes of distributional shifts is important. So distributional shifts due to changes in monopoly power are more likely to be wage-led, whereas shocks to unit labor costs are more likely to have profit-led effects. And then because the net exports are quite important, uh, the economy is more likely to be wage-led if it's relatively closed or if price effects are, are, are relatively small so that net, net exports are not very sensitive to relative prices. And I'll skip some of the other technicalities here. I already discussed that, that the tax system can also matter. And of course, the exact conditions for wage-led or profit-led outcomes will differ for different variables like the utilization rate and the growth rate, and in the open economy case, for different shocks to distribution. Now, if uh, you don't like math, you're in luck because there are no more equations here. What I have now, and I'll go through it fairly briefly, is actually four slides showing all the different directions that this literature has gone in since those third generation models were completed more or less by the early 1990s. Uh, and, and some of these literatures actually date back to that same era. So there's a, a lot of temporal uh, overlap here. And the number of references I would have to give is so enormous that I simply not tried to give it uh, here. I don't want to include some people and omit other people, so I just didn't give references. But if you know these literatures, you know who these folks are. Uh, so one early application by Amitabha and Lance Taylor and many others was to north-south trade and uneven development. Um, also just structuralist models of developing countries, uh, two-country models more broadly, and something that uh, Amitabha pioneered, and there's been a lot of more recent work on, particularly by Brazilian economists, uh, which is connections to balance of payments constrained growth and the impact of the currency depreciation. So there's a series of papers here. I will mention a few references by Rafael Ribeiro, uh, or Rafael Ribeiro, anglicized, uh, Gilberto Lima, and John McCombe, which essentially treat the short run of a third wall model as Koletskian, but the long run is third wallian. Another major area of extensions is to other areas of income distribution. So for example, we can di distinguish the retained profits of firms from the interest or dividend income of the rentiers like bondholders and stockholders or interest paid to banks. We can look at wage inequality by different types of labor, such as managers and production workers, or gender wage gaps, uh, wage inequality between men and women, and gender differences in paid and unpaid employment, and generally gender differences in participation uh, in, in the economy and in what's called now the care economy. And you could extend these same modeling techniques uh, and maybe it's been done uh, to address racial and ethnic differences, uh, immigrant labor, and so on. 
There's also a large literature that has worked on endogenizing income distribution and technology. So I'm not taking those as, as given the way many of these earlier models did. That means you need to model labor markets, unemployment, wage bargaining, and productivity growth, uh, where some of the options include the Verdorn's law, or the caldor verdorn law, or uh, more of a Caldorian technical progress function. Um, and as a result of this, I will mention one thing here, Nastapad, uh, you could find that distributional shifts, uh, oh, sorry, distributional impacts on employment can differ from effects on output because, for example, if demand is wage-led, uh, even if output rises when wages go up, employment might not if productivity uh, increases too much. Second slide on this, there's been a long running debate for, I guess, uh, at least 30 years now on whether capacity utilization is endogenous in the long run or not, and whether there is a convergence to a normal rate of utilization, and if so, is that rate unique or can that rate itself vary? Uh, one outgrowth of that is efforts to introduce Herodian instability into Koletsky or what you might call Koletsky Robinson models, uh, and where different ways of taming the Herodian instability usually modeled in terms of variations in the autonomous component of investment can lead to different resolutions of the controversy about the normal rate of utilization. And my book co-author Mark Setterfield has written on that, but also Mark Lavoie, Amitabh Dutt, and many others. Um, there are now Koletsky and super multiplier models. I think Mark Lavoie will speak about this in his presentation at this conference, so I should not say too much. But basically, in super multiplier models, long run growth is exogenous, driven by an autonomous component of demand, but distribution and other standard macro factors can still affect the long run level of output instead of the growth rate, and that can be quite important. There is, as I've alluded to earlier, a now enormous empirical literature estimating these sorts of models and testing whether countries have wage-led or profit-led demand or growth. The results are very mixed. They differ by methodology, uh, by looking at short-run versus long-run outcomes, by whether countries considered are larger or smaller or more open or closed. And in my recent paper, we, uh, my co-authors and I show they all also differ by type of distributional shock and historical period in the U.S. economy. Uh, that would be, have to be the subject of an entire separate presentation. Another outgrowth of this, and this also goes back to the work of Rothorn and Dutt in the 1980s, is models of conflicting claims inflation, uh, which can be uh, merged with Koletsky and models of aggregate demand. And then one offshoot of that is the Neo-Goodwin cycle models invented by Barbosa, Filio, and, and Taylor, uh, which assume profit-led demand and a profit squeeze to distribution. And it is exactly in relation to these models uh, that some have criticized them for ignoring what I showed you earlier, which is the pro-cyclical behavior of labor productivity and the profit share or the countercyclical behavior of the, of the wage share and how that could bias empirical estimates. Um, and then of course, there have been numerous efforts to uh, embed monetary policy, interest rates and financial relationships more broadly in the Okoletskian models and to address issues of financialization this includes models of debt dynamics for both corporate debt and household debt uh, and how that impacts on long-term stability or instability. Some of this literature now includes for the households what we might call veblen dusenberry emulation effects or expenditure cascades. And on the um, uh, corporate side, these models can be linked to Minskian views on financial fragility and crises. And some of these cycle models provide alternatives to the Neo-Goodwin framework for modeling uh, cyclical behavior of modern capitalism. 
Leo Koletsky and ideas have also had an important impact uh, in current debates about issues like inequality and stagnation. Eckhart Hein has recently revived Steindl's views on long-term stagnation, which I think are very relevant today. And uh, here I will mention a couple of people, Stefan Ederer and Miriam Rehm have applied a modified neo koletskian framework or Margaret Baduri framework to explaining uh, wealth inequality in the context of a critique of Piketty's views of the meaning of profit rate being greater than the growth rate. So these are some recent extensions that are very relevant. And last but certainly not least, and someone I think is going to speak about this later today, uh, maybe Eckhart, uh, and also Jan Toporowski, I think, uh, are going to talk about fiscal policy, so I don't need to say very much about that, but certainly it's been a great deal of work of blending in public investment, uh, critiques of austerity policies, and uh, there was earlier work on the distributional incidence of, of tax systems, for example, by Martin Slattery. So that's just a really quick tour. Uh, to the organizers, do I have time for two more slides? I know I'm a little bit over time, but we started a, a bit late. Just two more slides. Absolutely. Merci. So I think we should recognize that there are, are a great deal of what I would call Koletskian echoes in mainstream macroeconomics. These are generally unrecognized influences or unsighted rediscoveries. Uh, and, and many of the people doing this are literally unaware of, the, of who Koletsky was or, or this whole tradition of literature. Nevertheless, uh, and some people in these literatures are aware of the precedents. So one example, it's a bit older now, is neoclassical models of financial constraints on investment, for example, by Joe Stiglitz, which imply the importance of internal finance or cash flow, uh, which of course was an idea founded by Koletsky and Steindl and then developed by Minsky. Many of the new Keynesian macro models from the 1980s and 90s incorporated imperfect competition, either monopolistic or oligopolistic, modeled in a neoclassical way, but they definitely incorporated imperfect competition. More recently, we now have what are called heterogeneous agent models, which assume, uh, for example, different saving behavior of different classes of agents, like rich owners of uh, assets and, and workers who are liquidity constrained. There is a literature for the 1980s and 90s called labor rents. It was worked on by people like Larry Summers and the late Alan Kruger and Larry Katz. Uh, and that recognized how in oligopolistic industries, workers can bargain for a portion of the oligopolistic profits, which of course is exactly what Koletsky talked about in his 1971 paper on the class struggle and the distribution of national income and his earlier works. And last but not least, we now have a whole generation of literature on what's called heterogeneous firms. Uh, it was introduced into the international trade literature by Mark Mellitz in 2003, and then it invaded macro models. And of course, the original Koletsky and Steindl frameworks definitely had heterogeneous firms. Uh, there were oligopolistic firms, but they were of different sizes and had different cost structures. In uh, Steindl, there could be a competitive fringe surrounding them. And so the idea of heterogeneous firms is something that was really foundational in the Koletskian approach. And it was uh, another wheel that got rediscovered uh, with no citation of what came earlier. And then the, the contemporary macro literature is full of work on increasing concentration, rising profit markups, the falling labor share, and how all of these are related to inequality and stagnation tendencies. I could cite here the work of people like David Alter at MIT, Gordon Hansen at uh, UC San Diego, uh, Jan, I'm going to mispronounce this, but two Belgian economists, uh, uh, Eekhout and uh, what's the other guy's name? Delucker, Delucker and Eekhout. Apologies for me mispronouncing the Dutch or uh, Flemish, as the case may be. Uh, but there's big, oh, and not to mention the work of Piketty and uh, uh, Sias uh, 
and all of the people specializing in inequality. Uh, so in a way, Kaletsky was there long before all these things came about and his ideas were so foundational and should have much greater recognition. Let me conclude by just uh, giving a few thoughts that uh, will hopefully stimulate discussion. One is I have always been struck by Kaletsky's famous statement, for example, uh, I took this from the 1971 B, that's the uh, Cambridge University Press collection of his works. Uh, I know it's in many other places. The long run trend is but a slowly changing component of a chain of short period situations. It has no independent entity. I have always taken this to mean that Kaletsky was skeptical of long run and long period analysis in which uh, growth or utilization or anything has to uh, converge to a preordained, predetermined equilibrium rate or, or level. Um, nevertheless, neo models have been deployed, and I, I gave you an example earlier, to represent the short run period or sometimes medium run periods in models where there's another characterization of the long run, like the super bowl supplier characterization, balance of payments constraint, it could be classical Marxian or whatever. Alternatively, neo kaletskian models could be used to depict an evolving sequence of short run periods, but without presuming a tendency toward a predetermined long period outcome. And I would add here that I think, you know, Kaletsky did a lot of work in economic cycles. And I think he, he wanted uh, to have an analysis where the long run growth was cyclical and the trend was not predetermined. That is, the cycles were not around that exogenous trend, but the trend emerged out of the cyclical behavior. And uh, that would be a really interesting idea to, to re examine. Uh, lastly, and I've alluded to this several times, the Kaletskian approach started with micro foundations. I did not emphasize them today, but Kaletsky and Steindl both grounded their macro models in micro level analyses of the process of absolute concentration, the phase of monopoly capitalism or oligopolistic competition, and Kaletsky's concept of the degree of monopoly. Updating and deepening our understanding of these foundations, in my view, needs more attention. I know there is Definitely literature on this. Maybe it's being covered in some of the other presentations. But I, I, I believe, and I, I, this is a self-criticism as much as anything else, because I haven't done it enough. Uh, but I think our macro models need more linkages to these micro foundations uh, to show, for example, not just that a rise in markups uh, has stagnation, or not, not only causes stagnation, but, but how that process evolves uh, with the micro level changes in industry concentration and behavior. And this is important because we've had these long running disputes about things like the normal rate of utilization and what happens to that in the long run, is it unique or, or variable, and, and perhaps more work on the micro foundations can help to resolve these issues. I know there's been some work, for example, uh, by my co-author Mark Setterfield along with other co-authors using agent-based modeling to address these sort of questions. Uh, and and it certainly, there is this literature I mentioned in the mainstream of Altor, Dorn, and Hansen, and others, on the rising monopoly power of large firms. And uh, that's something that we, Kaletskians, should be addressing at both the micro and macro levels. And with that, I will stop, apologize for going over time, and open the floor for discussion. Um, so thank you, Robert, for the very interesting and clear presentation. As usual, I guess um, Louis-Philippe is the first one in line to ask a question. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, I have to congratulate you, Robert, for a real tour de force presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thorough and um, uh, amazing. Thank you. But as I was listening to you, you sort of <laughs> gave a presentation of, you know, 
heterodox macro period. And my question is, well, what is left of Keynes? And then my th th then the second um, second question is a little bit more serious, and I don't want you to be uh, to put you on the spot, but we kind of had a few exchanges about that. Uh, where is Basil Moore uh, in these models? Uh, and uh, the question is, where are banks? And I don't want to mean you know how it's generally treated, but you know uh, credit availability, uh, sort of endogenous money stuff, and and um, I wonder if you can uh, tell people uh, a few things on that. I know it's not uh, perhaps your area, but I think it would be a worthwhile uh, area for young uh, scholars to look into uh, moving forward. I just wanted to know what you thought of that. Thank you. Uh, wow, that's a huge set of questions. And, and I think there are probably a lot of other people here today, uh, virtually, who could, you know, answer a lot of parts of that maybe better than than I could. Um, but uh, I mean, let me start at the end. I said at the beginning that the models I was going to present are these efforts to distill Kolevskian ideas and to update them and to apply them. Uh, and I said early on, this is not a complete macro framework. And it's certainly not complete without you know, banks and endogenous money is an implicit assumption that either interest rates don't matter or interest rates are being held constant by the central bank in all those models. Um, and then there's these huge questions about, yeah, credit. So, so how do firms finance all that investment? We know the models tell us that eventually in equilibrium, the savings will rise to match the investment. That's the what some people call the widow's cruise, which uh, starts in Robinson's model and is also true in, in Kletzkian models. Uh, uh, but you know, what bridges that process is credit. And not only Keynes, but also Schumpeter realized that, that they have to have credit to launch production and, and, and to pay for investment before the profits and the savings are, are forthcoming. So you know, absolutely. Uh, adding those things in is, is absolutely crucial to a complete macro framework. Uh, so my only excuse for not including them is I had 45 minutes to talk about the basic Kolevskian model, uh, but I would never pretend that, that this is complete uh, without those things. Um, and maybe I should leave it for others to say, you know, uh, that's more of a thought question. Where is Keynes in all this? Uh, you know, this is a different approach to investment than Keynes had. Keynes's approach was based on fundamental uncertainty and the marginal efficiency of capital. Uh, and it, it's just, I think, different from the Kletzkian approach, which emphasizes you know, somewhat more objective determinants of investment, like the utilization rate and realized profits and financial constraints. Uh, so that's just one thought um, and you know, you know what they have in common I think is, is quite well known that output is demand determined uh, employment or utilization is variable although the Kletzkian approach more emphasizes utilization the Keynesian approach historically more emphasized employment but those two need to be bridged and one way for example is in that work the work that brings the labor market and productivity growth, endogenous productivity growth into the analysis and then looks at what happens to employment, which can be quite different from what happens to, uh, to output. Uh, but, you know, there was some discussion of this yesterday, you know, Kolecki formulated all of this independently. These three generations of models, as I see them, were efforts to build on Kolecki and they, they are Keynesian or post-Keynesian in a very broad sense. Uh, but they owe their origins to Kletsky and I think especially to Steindl, uh, and, and not so much to Keynes. They do have more in common with Robinson in some ways, but then, you know, it's a little hard to say what was the chicken and the egg there because she also had, she also learned from Kletsky, you know, long before she wrote Accumulation of Capital and her theory of economic growth in 1962, uh, you know, there was some influence of Kolecki as well as Straffa and Keynes and others. 
so I'll, you. I'll just stop there. I think other, yeah, I would love to hear much. other people's thoughts about that. Thank you, Robert. I guess Eric uh, is the next one in line, please. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I had a point or a question, which I'll raise in just a moment. I was not going to mention my own paper, but since you pointed out that um, Go ahead. Ta thanks talking about cycles around an endogenous trend, I, I do I do have a uh, a recent paper in Metro Economica where I, I do do that with a, an extension to a Kalitskian type model. Um, but the point is this: so uh, in the discussions about um, uh, the normal rate of utilization, one aspect of that that I just wanted to flag is empirical questions about the validity of the stability assumption. And, and there's, uh, there was some, some work by, by a, a, a mathematician, um, Blatt, uh, who showed that if you have a nonlinear model, like one with an unstable, uh, an, an unstable local equilibrium, but a ceiling and a floor, then a test with a linear specification will falsely suggest stability. So I, I just wanted to, to flag that, that that empirical question is part of, part of the debate. Thank you. I, I mean, I'll just take that as a, as a comment, um, but you know, it raises, uh, it's kind of an example of a larger issue. We have these empirical literatures, but as you point out, they uh, are very particular in their, in their methodologies. And certainly if, if relationships are nonlinear, but they're estimated with linear methods, yeah, the estimates will be biased and, and, and spurious. The same thing will be true if you ignore a structural break uh, or if you don't control for something like uh, procyclical behavior, productivity, and, and, and so many things. And so I've actually written a bit in other work on, um, you know, some of the biases built into different approaches to estimating these models, but that's a really valuable uh, contribution. I am not aware of the work of Blatt, uh, but I would love it if you would send me uh, those references, including to your own work, uh, you know, one of the things that, that's really true these days, you know, I went through those four slides just listing these, liter each of those literatures has dozens or even hundreds of papers in it. And it's really hard to keep up. You have to keep looking at all these different journals. Social media sometimes helps, at least the younger scholars uh, tend to post their papers. Wow, I got this accepted, so you can see it. Uh, but there's all kinds of specialized work that appears somewhere and we're all busy doing other things. We don't always see it. I'm not always aware of it. Uh, and uh, I mean, I already know of things. I wish that Mark and I had put in our book, but I, it wasn't on my radar screen at the time. So uh, all those references are, are very helpful. And, you know, it's also something we might want to think about institutionally. Uh, for those of you who are institution builders, and, and I know we have some things, these, these various uh, heterodox newsletters and uh, FMM has a newsletter and PKES shares information and so forth and so on. There's all the journals. Uh, but if there would be ways of kind of just letting people know what's out there, so we don't depend on somebody posted it on Facebook when I happen to be looking or I turned it up in a literature search or Google told because Google tells me about some people's work but doesn't tell me about other people's work. So I don't know how Google decides who I want to see. So, uh, but thank you for those references and really good points. Uh, so the next one is Ilya. Ilya, uh, Douglas, please. Yeah, thank you, Robert, for your effective uh, summary. I have two small questions. One, somewhere at the beginning of your presentation, uh, you indicated in an equation that something like profit share is negatively related to L1, which uh, refers to managerial labor, non-production labor, right? And uh, I, think so. uh, I think there should be a theoretical mistake, in my opinion, because managerial labor, which I call white color workers, uh, validate the markup through their consumption expenditures because they buy expensive high status uh, uh, goods, trademarks, and so on and thereby they uh, realize the markup uh, pricing 
big firms. And second, uh, you did mention uh, about the, whether the, this Bachelet uh, literature considers the employment elasticity of demand, which is a function of uh, either the production is capital intensive or labor intensive, which in, uh, means how the firms react to increasing demand either by production increase or uh, price increase. About that, Jan Toproski has a uh, paper. And uh, I think this is very crucial to understand if the economy wage led or profit led uh, because how the firms react to uh, increase in production is a matter of intensity of the production if capital or labor intensive and also uh, the employment composition matters here if it is composed mostly by uh, blue color workers or uh, managerial white color workers this whole is there any uh, study on that you didn't mention or there is no? If not, we can work on to <laughs> together about that. Thanks. Well, well thank you, Ilhan, for those, those excellent comments. Um, so if I understand what you're saying, what I showed from the first generation models of Asimakopoulos and Harris, and it's in Koletsky too, uh, it's very directly from Koletsky, uh, is it, you might say it's a direct effect. It's almost an accounting effect. So if you have uh, a lot of uh, overhead labor, uh, you know, that will exaggerate this uh, pro-cyclical behavior of productivity uh, and, uh, and, and the profit share. But yes, mathematically the amount, I, I think I, I should just share that slide again. Uh, is this working? Are you seeing this slide? Yeah, we can see it. But it's showing the wrong one. Okay, so this is way back in the first generation. I mean, listen, this is really just out of accounting relationships. Uh, so yes, this is the inverse relationship that uh, Ilhan is, is talking about. But yeah, it holds all kinds of things constant. So it holds the markup constant. And if I understood what you're saying, Ilhan, and it's a really excellent point, uh, the uh, income, if the L1 workers who are really the managers, supervisors, uh, technical and professional workers, if their high incomes lead to a different kind of consumption pattern that could then raise average markups because they buy uh, different kinds of goods that work, production workers would consume, is that the idea? I mean, that's a, just a really interesting uh, contribution right there. And uh, yeah, you know, the, 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 basically the, the inverse relationship takes the markup as given, but if, if there's a reason why the average markup would change, then that could, that could change the, the, the outcome. Um, on your second point, uh, that's another good comment. Uh, I would understand that partly in regards to structural changes in the economy, so what sectors is the output being created in? And as you say, those could use more labor or less labor. And so the employment effects uh, would differ. Um, I would also refer to open economy elements. So if uh, we have more demand for goods, but there's a lot of offshoring, uh, the employment will be created in a different country from the one where the demand is. Um, and then in the export oriented economies, they're getting demand from the outside, but that then allows their capitalists to essentially suppress the wages more to stay price competitive. And because they're not depending on domestic demand as much. So I would look at that in a global context and in the context of structural change between industries. And that certainly points to the need to have more multi-sector models, not just these one sector aggregated models. And I would be extremely sympathetic to that. Uh, the literature that exists, as far as I know, uh, has mostly looked at um, impact on uh, productivity, endogenizing productivity, as a way of, of vary, varying the uh, employment effects. 
but you're absolutely right that even with productivity being exogenous, if it, if it differs in different sectors or if employment coefficients differ in different sectors, uh, the same amount of demand can have a very different uh, employment uh, impact. And then if the goods can be sourced either at home or abroad, or if the output or the demand can come either domestically or from, from exports, again, uh, that would complicate the analysis. So those are what I would consider friendly amendments and yes, directions to expand these models in. Um, okay, uh, just so you know, I will call people with raise, raise hands first and then I will read the questions that some of you left uh, uh, in the chat box. So the next one is Amitabha Dutt, please. Hi, Robert. Hi, everybody. Um, um, this was a good review and it's interesting to see how different reviews of uh, a very similar literature can be different, and I, and I won't go into that too much, except to note that perhaps uh, I would have included a discussion of two-sector models, as you just mentioned, um, which is relevant for many, many countries and important issues, and also the distribution of wealth, uh, looking at, for instance, um, issues about um, workers saving or, or middle class savings and, and things like that. So, um, I mean, it, it, it's okay to leave out some things and I can see why you put in more of the open, open economy, but uh, in any case, <clears throat> I'd like to just make a, a couple of comments, if I may, about, uh, about the whole literature and what, what your survey of it seems to suggest to me. Um, one is that uh, there seems to be a very active effort to, to not only introduce uh, uh, real world phenomena such as uh, the middle class fi finance, uh, you know, money and, and all these kinds of issues, but also somebody comes up with a new model and then everybody sort of jumps into using that new model to incorporate the same old thing. Um, I mean, the, the latest example of is, is of course the super multiplier uh, model. And I, I do wonder about, and, and then also you have some sort of Herodian, Caldorian models as like my friend Peter Scott uh, tries to pedal. Okay. But, uh, but in any case, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a little um, sad to see so much effort on minor variations of different themes without thinking through really um, what's, what's, what's at issue. Uh, a second point I'd like to make, which is both has theoretical and empirical implications. You didn't cover the empirical issues very much, that is econometrics that much, uh, and that's fine, uh, is that people try to, um, uh, try to think that these models are actually things that ought to be estimated empirically. Okay, now, uh, and many of them start using words like this country is wage led, or that country is profit led. And, and I think this, this kind of literature is, you know, I'm, I'm all, all for it being done. It gets, gets, gets some people some uh, citations, which is fine, <laughs> fine with me. But, but I wonder if, if uh, this is a, uh, a good way to go. I mean, one of the reasons why you have wage and profit led, as you pointed out, is the investment function, uh, you know, the, the, the Aduri Marglin kind of investment function. Um, if you look at Kaleski, he had different kinds of investment functions and he never settled on one. Perhaps uh, Professor Osiatinsky can uh, co comment on that. Uh, he continuously changed them, okay, which suggests that uh, although he was a modeler, he, it was very difficult to model investment, okay? And, and, it's, and it's harder still, I think, to estimate them when there's uncertainty, okay? Yep. And so I think I would caution people about putting too much faith in these ideas and think of wage-led and profit-led, if you want to use that term, as possibilities of how to do something. Uh, of trying to improve uh, distribution without without damaging uh, 
growth or the macroeconomy. I think I'll stop it there. Uh, well, thank you, Amitabha, for those comments. I, I, I take it from that that I did not misstate any of your contributions and views, so I, I take that with some comfort. And I largely agree with everything you said. The two sector extensions are, uh, and they're not just extensions. I mean, these were in a lot of the original uh, papers. Um, and one of your first contributions was the Baran model of uh, North-South uneven development. That was in the 1980s. Uh, and implicitly, you know, has two sectors. Uh, so uh, it, it's really foundational also. And I, I, I generally agree with everything you said. Uh, on the empirical side, I, I totally agree. And I have written about this, and I've been critical of this in print, that, that, that we should characterize a country as uniquely wage-led or profit-led because we ran a few regressions of one type or another, and we, and, and we got a certain uh, outcome. We need to take that with a lot more grains of salt. Uh, there are the issues that someone raised, uh, I think it was Eric, earlier about um, whether even our models are correctly specified and, and therefore whether they're giving us biased results. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues and former PhD students, Mike Caudill, has done an exercise with VAR models where he shows that depending on how you model productivity, and what uh, ordering you use of the variables, and so what assumptions you make about the timing of, of macro shocks. I won't go into the technical details, but you can get either profit-led or wage-led results you know, out of the same uh, data set. But in, in the versions that control for the endogeneity of productivity, best in his mind, the profit-led findings in some studies disappear and actually turn to wage-led. Uh, but the results are extremely sensitive to different aspects of the specification, different methodologies. Uh, there's now a literature comparing long run and short run time periods. Uh, there's this paper by Sharpie, Bridgie, and McAdam. There's some from some Brazilian uh, economist, Ricardo Araujo, and maybe some co-authors. Uh, and again, looking at long run versus short run. Uh, I have been arguing for years that we need to distinguish that, that it's not unique with respect to the cause of why distribution changed. Um, and so I will get to mention this recent paper with uh, Qualbel, Kim, and myself, uh, where we find that for the U.S. economy, there was a structural break in the impact of shocks to unit labor costs in the early 1980s, kind of the beginning of the Reaganite neoliberal uh, regime and the time when globalization really took off. Uh, and prior to that, the markup was basically exogenous with respect to unit labor costs, sort of like Kletsky's closed economy model. Um, and then after that, there was a sensitivity. And so the results uh, really changed. Prior to uh, the early 1980s, uh, a shock to unit labor costs has the only significant effects are in reducing net exports, and so it's strongly a profit-led regime for that kind of shock. But after the early 1980s, uh, markups get squeezed, and you can you get some weekly wage-led results, but they're actually not significant. Uh, whereas for shocks to monopoly power, they're always having wage-led uh, implications. So just the variables you, you, you use to, you know, we shouldn't use, and this has been stated over and over again, we should really not be using the profit share as this exogenous factor driving demand. We have to look at what's underlying the changes in distribution. And then some of the studies have looked at domestic effects versus global effects. So it makes a huge difference if, for example, unit labor costs rise in one country, which then becomes uncompetitive, or they rise simultaneously in all the countries, then the competitive effects are essentially uh, canceled out and the domestic effects in stimulating consumption might be more important. So I absolutely agree that, that we should not characterize countries as uniquely being wage-led or profit-led. These are theoretical concepts uh, and they look very clean and simple in simple models which we use for pedagogical purposes and, for understanding the logic of, of, uh, of these systems, uh, but it, it's much more complex in, in reality. I totally agree with that. 
And the more you look at the empirical studies, the more you realize how fragile a lot of the results are. Okay, uh, so I guess uh, Jersey went to the end of the line. I don't know if that's on purpose. He was uh, the, the next one and then he entered the end of the line. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. No, no, I, I, want, <laughs> I wanted to take the floor. Okay, uh, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Robert, for, for a very interesting presentation. And I have a small question which relates to your slide with main uh, implications. Could you please go to that slide? Uh, main implications. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I think, you know, yes, there is this difference in saving propensities uh, between the uh, salaried uh, workers and uh, productive workers. And since uh, we, there is a huge literature to which you have yourself uh, referred about um, uh, debt finance and uh, household spending. Would your conclusions be much affected, affected if the SR and SW uh, prove negative, even assuming that uh, the, 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 this savings or, or debt financing of consumption of salaried people were greater because of their greater bankability compared to workers, productive workers. So when, when saving propensities are both negative with SR, perhaps greater in absolute terms than SW. Thank you. So you're asking what if the saving propensity out of profits becomes negative? When they are both negative because- Oh, they're both negative because yeah. very high debt finance consumption? Well, actually, we can see that, that debt finance consumption happens both to middle um, income workers and as to low income workers mm -hmm. who often borrow to, to, to make their living until the end, until the next payday. So it may well be that, that they are both negative. Uh, although I think it is reasonable to assume that that uh, the, this savings or, or debt financing consumption spending of, of salary up is greater than that of, of, of productive workers. What, what impact that would have on your argument? Uh, well, it would certainly impact the argument. Uh, I have not worked on those models. There are maybe other people here like Amitabha, Mark, and others who've worked on models of, of debt. Uh, certainly, you know, assets and debt dynamics can just completely take over and drive what goes on uh, once, once you, you add them in. Uh, the assumption that these propensities are both positive and exogenous is another enormous simplification, which as you say, may not be, be correct. Um, I think in some of the models, if I understand them correctly, the, these propensities are still positive, but there's an additional element of consumption that is funded out of either assets or debt accumulation. So that the kind of ex post saving rate can be negative or very low, even if the propensity to save out of current income is, is, is still positive. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure I could characterize in general how the models change. They certainly would change, and I, I don't think I want to guess on my feet here or, or sitting in my chair what the results would be, but certainly it, it could change the models profoundly. I'm sorry if that's not a very satisfactory answer, but uh, I think there are others who will be here at this conference who could probably give better answers than, than I can. Eckhart Hein has also worked on the models with firm debt. I don't know if he's ever worked on 
consumer debt. You know, Jim has worked a lot on models of household debt, as has Mark Satterfield. So if they join the conversation at some time, maybe they could comment more. And again, Mark McGuire and, and Amitabha have worked on this too. So I would just invite others to answer that question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. But it's a great question. And, and it does highlight once again, you know, these are the simplest and most basic models. They, they're not intended, and I think this is also agreeing with Amitabha said earlier, it's not intended that you take the simplest model right to the data and, and don't take into account all those other things. And, and I would point out that in some of the empirical literature, some of the work of uh, Engelbert Stockhammer and uh, uh, various co-authors, uh, also some of Oslo Oneron's work, it, it, you, you find that although there are these wage-led and profit-led effects, they're, they're actually completely dominated by uh, uh, the role of financial variables in driving recent behavior, like the boom in the early 2000s and the bust in the financial crisis. So that all of this wage-led profit stuff ends up being kind of second order of magnitude, and the driving forces are from the financial sector. So, those are not just small add-ons, those are really vital uh, things, but they're just not in this basic setup. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Okay, so the next one is Leonardo Vera. Well, thank you very much, Robert, for this very comprehensive presentation on neocalechian models. Uh, up I have basically one point, but let me frame uh, first uh, the point. There is always this reasoning on to what extent you know, Kalekian models reflect Kaleski key, key ideas on capitalist um, macro dynamics. And there are at least four aspects on, on this uh, neo Kalekian models that um, are not clearly linked with Kaleski on ideas. The first one that you pointed out is the presence of overhead costs. You know, in Kaleski accounting, uh, national income is divided in profits, wages, but also overhead costs. It's quite interesting that you uh, show us how in Donald Harris' uh, model, uh, the presence of overhead costs changes a little bit the results. Um, you introduce this procyclical uh, relationship between uh, um, um, output and the endogenous variables of the model. A second point, interesting point, is the assumption of this in this uh, neo collection models of constant markups. And yesterday uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, Kaleski ideas on the degree of monopoly, and Maria Cristina. Uh, said very clearly that for Kaleski, the degree of monopoly uh, changes over the business cycle. Uh, third thing is the investment function. In most neo Kalekian models, investment function is a very simple one. Even a Robinsonian in which investment depends on the rate of profit. But most of these investment functions are linear functions. And when you see Kaleski work on investment function, as Amitava said, uh, is really much more sophisticated work, even, even non-linear investment functions, even with a technological progress introduced into yeah. the investment function. So you see something yeah. richer in some, in some sense. And the fourth point is about this link between the short run and the long run. In most neo collection models, you have first a chapter on short run results. And then suddenly, you jump to the long run, basically saying, well, let's assume that something that is, is constant in the short run is now changes in the long run, and then you have a separate chapter on the long run. But as most of you know, and has been emphasized in this, this seminar, for Kaleski, the long run has no independent entity. It's very much linked to short run fluctuations. So this lead, uh, leads me to uh, the main point. I mean, how do we do with this, how, how do we do or how do we work this idea that a short run fluctuation, a big recession in the short run can have an impact on the long run path of the economy? 
Uh, and I think this is uh, one of the main challenges that neo collection models will have uh, in the future. And I would like to know your impression about this core issue. Uh, well, thank you. And, you know, once again, these are just excellent comments. You all are like continuing my presentation for me. Uh, you're quite right that, that these, you know, neo Koletskian models oversimplified some things that Koletsky himself saw as much more complex. For example, they usually explicitly or implicitly, they have one good or one firm, a representative firm, when Koletsky always understood that there was an underlying distribution of firms and different sectors in the economy, wage goods, capital goods, and so on, uh, luxury goods. Um, uh, the assumption of constant markups, I mean, I've been critical of that throughout my career, so my idea of the flexible markup for an open economy was an effort to make the markup not rigid, not constant, but there are many other contexts in, in which that can happen, not just international tr trade. Again, sectoral recomposition of the economy, which I mentioned earlier, uh, changes in, I mean, policy. I mean, you look, there is this incredible rise in profit margins that's going on now. And those uh, mainstream economists I mentioned have actually done great work on this. So one feature in the US economy is that the share of the firms that have the higher markups is rising, and that's helping to account for the uh, rise of the average profit share. Uh, they call that the rise of a superstar firm. So you look at the Amazons, the Googles, and Microsoft, and so on, uh, Walmart. Uh, and so there's really a lot of structural change going on in the economy. And then that links to consumption patterns and the rise of the professional managerial class. Yeah, these are all directions we need, we need to go in. And I, I, it's certainly not my purpose to defend the simple models as representing reality. Uh, they're intended to represent a few core ideas, which I still believe are core ideas. And then I also agree with you, and I, I guess it was Amitabha about, about is it, I mean, some of the, about the investment functions being incredibly uh, oversimplified. Uh, Steindl had an investment function. It had four elements in it. Uh, one was the utilization rate. One was something about the ratio of own capital to total capital. I think there was the gearing ratio or debt. And then there was a fourth variable. Uh, and, and yes, Koletsky and Steindl played with many different variations and were never uh, satisfied. So I don't think there's any one investment function is the Koletsky investment function. And these are all uh, highly oversimplified. And then yes, the overhead costs have been uh, very much forgotten. And I plead guilty on that too. I have not usually included them uh, in my uh, theoretical papers. Uh, Mark Lavois has done a much better job of keeping those in sight. In our book, uh, Mark and I decided to put in that harris assimic copulus model as an appendix to a chapter at the last minute because we realized it was so relevant to the, our critique of the empirical studies. Mm -hmm. But it's already, if there's ever a second edition, it's going to move out of an appendix and into the beginning of the chapter because it's so important. So uh, I just take your comments, like a lot of those that we've had just now, as being uh, more than friendly amendments. You know, this is citing a lot of areas that we need to think about and deepen ourselves in. And thank you, Leonardo. And it's great to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah, great, great to see you again. Mucho tiempo. Yeah. <laughs> I think since those conferences in where was it, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, or somewhere. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good yeah. to see you. Es un gran, well. gran placer verte nuevamente, Robert. Igualmente, abrazos. Sorry for this little Spanish interruption. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think our time is up. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us in this session, a very interesting and active session. Uh, thank you once again, Robert, for your presentation and Louis Philippe for making this happen. Uh, the next session will start at 10.45 uh, in eight, around eight minutes, New York time zone. Uh, Malcolm Sawyer from the University of Leeds We'll talk about uh, Kaletsky and the case against austerity.